Thank you for joining us today. Our Bible study is entitled, Sinners Do Not Go to Hell? Question mark. Where do those who have rejected Christ specifically spend eternity? Uh, last week, I did a Bible study entitled, Christians Don't Go to Heaven? Question mark. And I had promised you that I would follow up with our Bible study today. Sinners do not go to hell, question mark. And just as in our study, Christians do not go to heaven, uh, you learn that many people do not have a proper understanding of heaven. Uh, today, I think you'll find out that just as many do not have a proper biblical understanding on the subject of hell. And in our Bible study today, we're going to answer six questions. Number one, why is there so much confusion on hell? Number two, what is Sheol? Number three, what is Hades? Number four, what is Gehenna? Number five, what is hell? And then we'll conclude number six by answering, where exactly do sinners spend their eternity? And uh, as we begin the Bible study today, I want to, from my heart, say I sincerely appreciate you being a part of our Bible study. I hope that you're already a subscriber and you've hit the notification bell to become a part of our weekly growing global Bible study we don't want you to miss a single week of content. And if you're new to our content, we focus uh, specifically upon questions that are sent in by you, uh, the viewing audience, and we also spend a lot of time dealing with Bible prophecy and current events and teaching from the scriptures the pure doctrine of eschatology and end time events. So let's get started today with our Bible study on hell, and let's discover exactly where do all who have rejected Christ spend their eternity. Uh, we're reading today out of the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, and the 20th chapter and let's begin reading at verse 7 and read down through verse 15. The Bible said, when the thousand years come to an end, now just hit pause for a moment, that thousand years is speaking of an end time event called the millennium. That's why it's called a thousand years. When the thousand years, the millennium, comes to an end, Satan will be let out of prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for a battle, a mighty army, as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it, the earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. Run your highlighter through that. We'll come back to it. The lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, 
and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. As we always do, let's take some time to pray together before we get into the depth of this study. Heavenly Father, once again, uh, we humble our hearts in your holy presence and we bow and confess our need of you and the wisdom and the counsel and the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we endeavor to make the word of God clear and understandable. I pray specifically for those who may be listening to the Bible study today and maybe in their own heart, they're not sure about heaven and they're not sure about hell. I pray that today would provide for them surety, that they might understand that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. May many come to know you today as Lord and as Savior, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory For we ask it all in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Uh, It probably will not come as a great surprise to you that uh, a large percentage of people believe in the existence of heaven, but not such a large percentage of people believe in the existence of hell. And many are surprised at the Bible as they began studying it to find that Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry actually taught more on the subject of hell than he spoke on the subject of heaven. Unlike many in ministry today, Jesus was not politically correct and he certainly was not afraid to teach and explain uncomfortable manner. Uh, I will tell you this, all of us were born headed in the wrong direction. You know, many times I know there are people by the hundreds of thousands and some videos even in the millions who listen and you may feel like you're the worst sinner on the face of the earth and that God could never love you or forgive you. I want you to be sure to understand that that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, for God so loved the world. That's all. And the Bible says, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All of us have equal opportunity to be forgiven of our sins and to begin a genuine relationship with God as our Heavenly Father. But let me be clear about something. Romans 3.23 tells us, all have sinned. There's not one single person from this minister on down the line that could say, I have never sinned. So when I say we were all born headed in the wrong direction, what I mean by that specifically is we were all born wandering away from God. And when the Bible says repent, The Bible said, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out in the book of Acts. The word repent means to turn around. You were born headed in the wrong direction, but today in childlike faith you can turn around and begin walking in the direction of God. Now our Bible study is actually a question. Sinners don't go to hell question mark. And if you're taking notes, I promised we'd address six questions. Question number one, why is there so much confusion on the subject of hell? Uh, There are many reasons why the subject of hell in the Bible can be confusing and daunting to a new student of the scriptures. Perhaps the main reason is the Bible uses many terms, terms like hell, Sheol, Haiti, Gehenna, the lake of fire, the abyss, and so on. There are many terms in the Bible that describe the eternal judgment 
and the afterlife concerning the unrighteous. And many just assume that all of these words are synonymous and that they basically are identifying the same geographical location, but as you're going to learn today, they are not. And then there is added confusion by many of the myths that some of you perhaps grew hearing and uh, cultural opinions. Uh, There's uh, inerrant uh, statements made concerning um, hell in the scriptures, but there are all kinds of erroneous statements made in culture, Uh, not to mention Hollywood and television and the internet and, and movies. There is much confusion that's connected to that. But sadly, many Bible teachers and pastors never preach on hell or eternity uh, because it's perhaps unpopular and unpleasant and they don't want to risk offending their audience. Let me tell you something about a true man of God or a true woman of God. You should have a genuine man of God in your life that has no fear of people or the polls or the popularity or the politics. And that's what we endeavor to do is just open the Bible and tell you what God said. And the Bible said much about heaven and the Bible said much about hell and eternity. And I'm going to do my best to answer your questions in a straightforward way. Question number two What is Sheol? Uh, Spelled in the Bible, S-H-E-O-L. Sheol, uh, when we study the Hebrew scriptures and the Old Testament, the word Sheol from the Hebrew is used to describe the place of the dead. Uh, Sheol simply means the place of the dead or the place of departed souls. So when you see Sheol in the Bible, it's from the Old Testament, and it means the place of the dead, the place of departed souls, and so forth. Question number three, what is Hades? Well, uh, again, if you're a new student of the Bible, we have an Old Testament, we have a New Testament. The Old Testament is primarily written in Hebrew, the New Testament primarily in Greek. So Sheol is from the Hebrew. The word Hades is from the Greek. And it means the exact same thing as Sheol. It's used to describe the place of the dead or departed souls. So the word Hades is simply uh, the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Sheol. Uh, I want you to go into your Bible, into uh, the book of Luke, and the uh, 16th chapter. Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 26, the Bible tells us, Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 26, uh, reading this passage out of the New King James Version. uh, There it reads, so it was that the beggar died... And was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, Abraham's bosom, translated in the English, goes back once again to the Old Testament and to the Hebrew scriptures. And it was used to synonymously uh, speak of heaven. So in the Bible, when you hear terms like Abraham's bosom, paradise, heaven... It referred to, all terms referring to, the current heaven. As you learned in last week's Bible study, and let me just take a moment, if you have not listened to the Bible study, Do Christians Go to Heaven? You need to listen to it after you listen to this one. These two Bible studies are presented to you like bookends, And because of the time devoted to each, I wanted to give them independence. But be sure you listen to, do Christians go to heaven? Today we're dealing with, do sinners go to hell? The Bible said the beggar died, was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments, 
in Hades. Run your highlighter through Hades. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here pass to us. Very important uh, piece of theology that we discover as we mine through Luke 16, that being, once you enter into heaven... It's irrevocable. You can never be taken out of heaven and sent to hell. But tragically, once you enter into hell, it's also irrevocable. And you can never be taken from hell and placed into heaven. No one can pray you out of hell. No one can buy you out of hell. No one can negotiate with God on your sentence. It is eternal and irrevocable. So here in Luke chapter 16, we discover the word Hades, and we discover what it is. Hades is a temporary holding place for the spirits or the souls of the dead. But in this state... And we're talking about a different state that will come. I'll come to that in the moments ahead. In this state, it is divided into a place of comfort for the souls of the righteous. But there's also a great gulf fixed to another place that is a place of eternal torment for the unrighteous. So remember that in the Hebrew scriptures, Abraham's bosom is synonymous with paradise and also with heaven. You'll remember if you're a student of the Bible that at the crucifixion of Christ, one of the thieves turned to Christ and that penitent thief said, if you're really the son of God, have mercy on my life. What did Jesus say? He said, today you will be with me in paradise, heaven, paradise, Abraham's bosom, describe the current heaven. But as you learned in our other Bible study, we know that in Revelation 21, there's coming a new heaven and a new earth. Question number four, what is Gehenna? Now, Gehenna comes from the Greek. In the New Testament, the Greek word Gehenna is used as an equivalent to hell. The Greek word Gehenna actually has its root in a Hebrew word, actually a genuine, legitimate location. And the Hebrews called it Gehenna, and from the Greek Gehenna, but from the Hebrew Gehenna. It was a literal place, an actual valley south of Jerusalem, and Gehenna was a place of, of horrible trash, human waste, decay, putrid smells, maggots, rodents, and they tried to keep a fire going there uh, for sanitary purposes and also to try to disguise some of the putrid smells and, and kill bacteria and so forth. And so Jesus used the word Gehenna to provide a, a visual, as it were, to a well-known geographical location that all of his audience would have been familiar with. Jesus used that legitimate, horrific place to describe the place of judgment where the souls of the unrighteous awaited. 
Uh, question number five, what is hell? Now, the Bible is explicit. I know there are many today who are trying to teach and say that it is impossible for a loving God to create a place like hell or send anybody to hell. Uh, it is absolutely hypocritical for Christians or ministers or theologians to assert that God is love on one hand and then speak about hell on the other. But even though hell has been rejected by many liberals and even liberal theologians, the Bible is explicit and leaves no wiggle room in defining the horror of an eternal hell as a place of misery and suffering. But I want you to listen carefully because a lot of people are not aware of this. Did you know that hell was not created for the human race? You know, when people ask me that question, how can you preach that God is a God of love and yet preach a message on hell or teach as I'm teaching today on the graphic, horrible hell described in the scriptures? Well, the first thing that I do when I respond to people is you're right. God did not create hell for the human race. He created hell for the devil uh, and the demonic spirits or the fallen angels. Let's go into Matthew's gospel and let me show you in the Bible where it actually teaches us that. Matthew chapter 25 verse 41, the Bible said, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So Jesus taught us in Matthew 25 that hell was originally created for the devil and the fallen angels or the demonic spirits. But we were all born with sin. We were all born headed in that wrong direction. But God provided a way out of that. Listen very carefully. It is not God's will for you or anyone else to go to hell. The Bible said in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, God spoke his will there. He said, I am willing that none should perish. I am willing that none should perish. The word perish means face judgment or damnation for unrepented sin. God said, if I had my will, I am willing that none should perish. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. If you go to hell, it'll not be because God sent you there. It will be because when he offered you forgiveness, when he offered you salvation, when he offered you Christ, his only begotten son, who died on the cross to pay the price for my sins and your sins, when he freely and lovingly and graciously offered you forgiveness, you spit on his hand and turned your back and walked away and said, I don't want God, I don't want Christ, I don't want forgiveness, I want to live my life my way. Well, he created you with a free will. But if you reject Christ, then you have received hell. There really is a heaven. There really is a hell. Where you spend your eternity is your decision. God said, I will that none should perish. God said, if he has his will, you'll make it to heaven. But he's not going to override our free will. He didn't create us like artificial intelligence. We are not robotic. We are not pre-programmed. We were created in the divine image of God. And because God has a will, he created us with a will. He wills heaven. But you also have to will heaven. But make no mistake, to receive Christ 
is to receive heaven. But to reject Christ is to choose hell. Hell is a place of torment and punishment. The Bible tells us that lasts forever and ever with no end. Question number six, where exactly do sinners spend eternity? And that uh, was sent in. It's a great question. Let me repeat it again. Where exactly do sinners spend eternity? Well, I think you already know from the teaching that I've provided and the multiple passages that I've read and the verses that I've quoted that all who reject Christ will spend eternity in the lake of fire. All those unrighteous souls who are currently in the holding place of Sheol, remember Sheol from the Hebrew, or Hades, Hades from the Greek, but the same place, again just as a reminder, Sheol and Hades are the same place. But all unrighteous souls after the final judgment will be taken from Sheol or Hades and cast into what the Bible describes as the lake of fire. Uh, let's, let's take the time to go into the scripture and, and read that. Revelation and the 20th chapter. And the 12th verse, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, it said, I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. There it is, run your highlighter through it, into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, the theological term here, the lake of fire, is found exclusively in the book of Revelation and just in a few passages. Uh, the term lake of fire is found in Revelation 19 and 20. It's found in Revelation 20 and verse 10. And it's also found in Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15. Now don't miss this, listen carefully. Hell, or the lake of fire, or outer darkness, are all terms in the Bible that are synonymous. Let me say it again for those that are taking notes. Hell, the lake of fire, outer darkness, depending on the translation of the Bible you read from, those three terms in the scripture are synonymous, and they describe, are you listening, the final destination of everyone who has rejected Christ. Hell is a place of never-ending torment, complete separation from God. It is inescapable, it is irrevocable, and it is eternal. And so there is currently a holding place, Haiti, Sheol, again Sheol from the Hebrew, Haiti from the Greek. Those are a current holding place of the tormented souls of all who have rejected Christ and all of the unrighteous souls awaiting judgment. But after the final judgment, all of those unredeemed, unrighteous souls will be judged from the books by their own actions, by their own words, by their own deeds, and they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is hell or outer darkness forever and forever 
without end and eternally so. It's a horrible thing to think about. It's a graphic thing described in the scripture. The Bible said there will be screaming and wailing and gnashing of teeth and skin worms to destroy the body. So when the question is asked, sinners go to hell, question mark? Yes. Three times in the book of Revelation, it's called the lake of fire. But the lake of fire, hell, outer darkness are all synonymous of the same location where the souls of the damned will forever abide. I don't want to conclude with that because I've already emphasized it more than once, but I want to conclude by praying with you because I have preached for nigh unto 50 years and I have taught and I am currently serving as a president of a Bible college and teach our students. And one of the things that I've always te taught is that no one should ever preach on hell without an invitation to go to heaven. And so today I want to give you an invitation. I've already made clear to you from the scripture, 2 Peter 3, 9, God said, I'm willing none should perish, but all should come to repentance. If God had his perfect will in your life, he would receive you today. But it's a relationship, and no relationship can be forced. Relationship by its very essence has to be mutual. God has offered forgiveness, but you must receive it. And by praying with me today, listen, I'm not asking you to join a denomination. I'm asking you to make peace with God. And the only way to be forgiven of sin and to make peace with God is to receive Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one can come to the Father except through me. And so maybe today you'd pray with me. Has anybody ever loved you enough to say no matter what you've done, no matter what your sin, no matter what your past, there's a God in heaven whose grace is greater than your sin. But you must make a decision to turn from sin and turn to Christ. We'll do that right now. And when we're done praying, will you take a moment to write down in the comments, just write something simple like, Tiff, I prayed that prayer today. Uh, Tiff, I, I gave my heart to Christ today. I want to be a real Christian. From your heart, just write me a brief comment in the comments section if you're listening on the podcast or other platforms, you can email us. Our ministry email will be on the screen, info at lostlamb.org. Let me know that you prayed that prayer today because we sincerely care. And anything we can do to help you, we'll do that. Pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. And today, I choose heaven. I reject hell. I confess all my sin. And I trust in your grace and in your mercy. With the blood that your only son Jesus shed on the cross, cleanse my mind, my body, my spirit. Make me holy in your eyes. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and turn my heart to Jesus. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen.